It could be argued that without truly understanding grace, we cannot even begin to try and understand God, his son Jesus, or indeed the gospel message. What I hope to do this afternoon is introduce biblical grace to those here who may be new to the Bible, but also help all of us in developing our understanding of what is an infinitely powerful concept and a fundamental characteristic of God. So, just to recap, let's start with a a very simple, earthly example of what, what most people think grace might be, or as close as we can get to on this earth. I had a friend who had just bought the car of their dreams, and early one morning he was driving on an open stretch of road, which he thought would be the perfect place to find out just how fast his new car could go. The speedometer was easing its way upwards, and before long he went over a small hill, and just as he went over this hill he spotted a police officer with a speed gun. Before long, the officer caught up with him and stood behind him and said, do you have any idea how fast you were going? 100 miles an hour, the officer said. So guilt was obvious and there was no possible excuse for my friend um, that he could offer. He only had to wait and find out what his punishment, his righteous punishment was to be. To his amazement, though, the policeman said, would you mind if I take a look at that engine under, under the bonnet? And a while later, after some discussion about the advantages of a, nas- uh, an, a, um, a naturally aspirated engine versus one that's turbocharged, both of the men shook hands and went their separate ways. My friend was delighted because the policeman had not given him a ticket. He had not deserved such kind treatment, but indeed fully deserved the punishment that he he should have got, but none came. So that small example might be what most people think of as as an earthly example of grace. However, what we'll see is from from the scriptures, from what we study, that biblical grace is infinitely greater and more powerful than what most people understand grace to be without knowledge of God and the scriptures. It has been argued then that the principle of grace is as fundamental to Christianity as justice is to law or love is to marriage. Christianity cannot be understood apart from an adequate grasp of grace. And it's the doctrine of grace which distinguishes the Christian faith from every other religion in the world. And rightly understood and applied the doctrine of grace can revolutionise one's life. So grace is often simply defined as God's unmerited favour towards us as sinners. Some people use an acronym, um, which I actually don't don't like, but this is an acronym which some people use, um, grace standing for God's riches at Christ's expense. I'm not a fan of that, That's, but I hear that, that, used, that term used quite a lot. Um, but I think these, these definitions are, are somewhat inadequate and, and they don't give us the full picture. And hopefully we will explore by, and better define and understand grace um, by proposing a series of statements that we'll go through um, this afternoon. So statement number one, grace is part part of the very character of God. So grace is most frequently spoken of as a a commodity that is distributed, and it is in one respect. But first and foremost, grace is a description (coughs) of the very character of God, and that God is a God of grace. And he desires for us to know this. And the attribute of grace has always been a part of God's character, since God is unchanging. Often Christians 
feel somehow that, or can, I've heard in the past, they feel that the God of the Old Testament almost seems like someone else to the God of the New, such as the contrast. But the grace of God is equally evidenced in the Old Testament scriptures, and men of God of the Old Testament knew him as a God of grace. So in Psalm 78 and verse 38, we read of his grace towards Israel. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. And we read again in Nehemiah 9 verse 17, again, of his attitude towards Israel and his grace and mercy. So Nehemiah 9 verse 17. They refused to obey and were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you, O you God, are ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. It was also the overflowing grace of God that displeased Jonah the prophet. It angered Jonah because this time God's grace was granted to the enemies of Israel. And ironically in, in that story it was grace in the end which kept God from dealing with Jonah as severely as his sin would deserve. And the gracious character of God was fully manifested in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, who we read in, in John 1.18 that he's, he's the revealer of the Father. In, in John 1 verses 14 and 17, we read, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And Jesus too demonstrated grace, for he did not come to judge and to condemn, but he came to forgive and to save. So we can do nothing else but conclude that God is, was, and ever will be a God of grace, and that is a fundamental part of his character. Statement number two. Grace is epitomised on the cross. So, I said earlier about um, the grace of the Old and the New Testament. It could be argued that while the grace of God is, is described in the Old Testament... It is not fully defined until the new. For grace is not merely a part of the plan of redemption in the gospel message in the Bible. It is redemption. The entire work of Christ in dying for sinners and being crowned with glory. It is said by the writer to the Hebrews to be by the grace of God. Hebrews 2 verse 9 says... But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might, take, might taste death for everyone. And the gospel is named as the gospel of grace uh, in Acts 20 verse 24. And the scriptures are the word of his grace. And that's, that's, that's the phrase used in Acts 14 and verse 3. Statement number 3. While grace has always existed as part of the character of God and was epitomised on the cross, it is also expressed in a wide variety of forms. We can't look at all the forms now, but let's look at a few. Common grace. Common grace is called common as it is poured out on everyone. 
regardless of position or condition. God is gracious in making this provision for the salvation of all men. Securing grace is the manifestation of grace by which Christians are kept secure in spite of sin. 1 Peter 5 verse 12 calls us to stand firm in the true grace of God. And being secure and being firm in the grace of God means we can then grow and mature and develop other Christ-like characteristics. Saving grace, no sorry, serving grace refers to acts of generosity and, and, and giving. The term gift being a derivative of the word grace. In Ephesians 4 verse 7 we read, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And 1 Peter 4 verse 10, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Sustaining grace is a grace given at special times of need during adversity or suffering. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 we read, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Hebrews 4 16, Let us there, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of, in times of need. So those are just a few ways in which grace is is manifested in, in, in different forms. Grace saves us, it keeps us secure, it enables us to serve others and to endure the tests and trials of life. And ultimately, grace will bring about our sanctification and bring us to glory. Statement number four. Grace is pure. If we were to to describe grace to a chemist or scientist, we would say that grace is an element and not a compound. In biblical terms, grace is is never a mixture of the divine and human effort. Grace can only ever be purely of God. We read that in in, uh, Romans 11 verse 6. Romans 11 verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise grace is no longer grace. So grace is entirely of God, unprompted by man and undeserved by man. To make even the slightest (coughs) contribution to our salvation, if we try and make that, it's to rule out the possibility of grace. For one thing, and I've got an example for this in a second, any contribution on our part, we would exaggerate in our own minds as if we'd somehow earned um, a reward. So here's an example to to illustrate this. Suppose you were invited to a a magnificent banquet at, at number 10 Downing Street. But as you left that evening, you greet the Prime Minister at the door and wish to show your appreciation. You say to him, Prime Minister, I want to thank you so much for a wonderful evening. And I know this must have been a very great expense. So I would like like to make a small contribution to help cover the cost. You then press a pound coin into his hand and leave. That is no compliment and that is an insult. Grace does not require nor will it accept any contributions from us. And that's a very positive truth because the grace of God is absolutely free, freely given to us. 
we do not have to earn that and we we cannot you cannot earn that it's 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 um it's too um you, you cannot earn something that um is freely freely given in that respect otherwise it's no longer freely given and this this truth is not an easy one for us to to believe because we have come in life to doubt that anything can be really free but god's pure love and grace has been lavished upon us without measure statement number five grace is sovereign so since we have no claim to god's grace and we cannot contribute anything towards it, then grace must purely be sovereignly bestowed. And that is to say that we cannot affect grace. It is freely given to all from God. We read in um, Exodus 33 verse 19 of what God said to Moses. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And the necessary conclusion of that is found in Romans 9, verse 16. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Statement number six. While the law can define righteousness, grace is the only source. The law, in the giving of strict rules to follow, was never intended to be a means of obtaining grace, but instead it was given as an imperfect precursor to demonstrate to men that grace was desperately needed. In Galatians 3, verse 24, we read, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. At its heart, legalism and the belief of obtaining righteousness through your own works is a humanly divine, uh, devised system whereby a man may strive to produce his own righteousness by a rigid adherence to a prescribed code of conduct. And that is external in nature and that evaluates actions as opposed to attitudes and motives. And worse still, legalism tends to lower the standards that God has set. In the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord persisted in raising the standards set by the scribes and the Pharisees and not lowering them. For example, he called us not only to love our neighbour, but to love our enemies. And it was because of the lowering of God's standards by the Pharisees that the rich young ruler could say to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. And only a legalist who believed in righteousness by actions and not grace could say this and therefore be justified in their own sight. So legalism cannot coexist with grace. We read in Galatians 5 verse 4, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. And Romans 6 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Statement number seven. Grace is given only to the humble. When Jesus was on earth, he came to minister to the poor, the suffering and the needy. And it was to the poor in spirit that Jesus offered the riches of the kingdom of God. 
Jesus put his finger on this matter when he told the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18. We'll read this now. Um, the, the Pharisee, and you'll see that the Pharisee had no appreciation for his own sinfulness. So Luke 18, verses 11 to 12, we read, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus, well, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. The tax collector, however, was humbled by the awareness of his sinful condition, and he so then asked a gracious God, who he knew to be a gracious God, for mercy. God be merciful to me, a sinner, said the tax collector. And Jesus said it was this humble sinner who went home justified in verse 14. Verse 14 reads, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So grace is the goodness of God on behalf <coughs> of sinners who humbly acknowledge that their own deficiency and because of that deficiency their dependence upon the grace of God for forgiveness and salvation. And finally on that point we read in James 4 verse 6 that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Statement number eight. Grace is granted in harmony with God's other attributes. So it's possible at this point to misunderstand the grace of God by supposing that grace is somehow granted at the expense of God's justice, um, another of his, his characteristics. But nothing could be, could be further from the truth because grace does not set aside the requirements of justice, but it satisfies them. Because of the covering of grace, the Christian is no longer guilty before God and need not stand under the condemnation of sin. But someone did have to pay the penalty for sin, and that was our Lord Jesus Christ. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, we read, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And in Romans 3, Paul dealt with the need for grace to be shown in such a way as to not violate the principle of justice and the justice of God. So in Romans 3, verses 24 to 26, we read, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at this present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So in conclusion then, our God is a God of grace. In his grace, he has spoken to us through his word, the Bible. And in his grace, God sent his son to the cross so that we can be saved. And that God's grace is for sinners like you and like me. So let us humbly come before God in the knowledge that we cannot contribute anything to deserve 
the gift of life. It is purely a gift through God's love and grace. And it is in God's love and grace alone that we all have our hope of the future time to come.